Mumbai, India. November 2008. The world watches on as a fire rages at the city's most famous landmark, the luxury Taj Mahal Hotel. It's rumored that up to 60 terrorists are behind a series of commando-style attacks. 59 hours after the attacks began, 166 innocent people are dead. The whole world wants to know who did this and why, and how such an attack could be perpetrated right under the noses of security forces. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Mumbai, November the 26th, 2008. Trident Oberoi Hotel. Holistic healer Rudrani Devi is with friends on a meditation holiday. It had been such an exciting day. And uh, we were talking about what we were going to do the next day. So I was going to do all my Christmas shopping. And I had all these gifts. And I was going to do it all in one day. I had it all planned. <laughs> Suddenly we heard what sounded like little pops. You know, bah, 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 bah. And my friend next to me turns to me and he says, well, that sounded like uh, gunshots. And I said, you know, it, it did sound like gunshots. So I said, well, I think I'm going to go check it out. He was gone for a few moments. We resumed to talking about the day. And then he shows up, sits down, doesn't seem concerned. And when I asked him, what's going on he said oh the staff said not to worry it's just some hooligans thirty seconds later i said everyone get under the table now I actually felt the man standing on my yoga pant leg. I could feel this boot, and I could feel when he was shooting. I could really feel that ripple of the gunfire, and the shells were falling on me, and they were warm. They were hot. He stood there for a moment and felt, felt like an eternity. I felt like somebody pinched my arm in half. And then I just kind of felt a throbbing. Um, and what had happened is it literally had taken my tricep right out of my arm. Rudrani senses the gunman move away from her table. One of my friends, he was there with his daughter and she was screaming. She was very fearful. And I put my hand actually on the back of his neck to get his attention, and we made eye contact. I looked at him and I said, like, we need to be really quiet now. Within seconds, I felt something really shake my arm, and I knew that he had been hit. I knew it. When I looked back, that whole side of his face was gone. Ten minutes on from the first attack, two men exit a taxi and enter the Cafe Leopold, a popular hangout with Western tourists. Dara Huang and her boyfriend John are here enjoying the last night of their trip. We heard a huge, like, bang. And the whole restaurant fell silent for like two seconds. 
And then we just kept eating, and then the talking came back. A few seconds after that, we heard consecutive shots just ring to the restaurant. My instincts were just to just get up and run. John actually threw me on the floor. There's a momentary break in the gunfire. And I just thought, if I don't get out of here, um, I'm going to die. Three kilometers away, two men enter the Chhatrapati Shivaji terminus, one of the world's busiest rail stations. Back at the Trident Oberoi Hotel, Rudrani Devi's friend and his daughter lie dead. Believing the gunmen have left the restaurant, Rudrani sees her chance to escape. I immediately try to get up. And this is when I first noticed that my leg has been shot. And I'm watching blood actually pouring out of my leg. And I realize there's no way I can stand. And so I throw my arms up and, and I say, drag me. As Rudrani is dragged to the restaurant's kitchen, the gunman returned. They started firing at the door. Shortly after that, something went flying through the service window, and I knew it was a grenade. It didn't go off. At the Taj Mahal Hotel, security cameras captured two men with backpacks entering the lobby. While at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus, Laxman Hundakari waits to return home after signing up for police training. Two men armed with machine guns enter the concourse. When the first grenade exploded, people started running away. They opened fire on everyone. People were getting hit by bullets and desperately trying to get out. Laxman is hit by shrapnel. I realized the bone in my leg was completely fractured. I wanted to get away, but because my leg was broken, I couldn't. There was a guy next to me. He was about my age. He was scared, too. At the Taj Mahal Hotel, the two men with backpacks are scanning the premises. British Asian entrepreneur Lord Gulam Noon is saying goodbye to a colleague. I thought maybe the firecrackers, because they're always awaiting in Taj Mahal Hotel. I didn't take much notice of it. I pressed the elevators uh, and, and uh, switch and I went up. Seconds later, Dara Huang and her boyfriend John rush into the hotel, fresh from their ordeal at Cathy Leopold. We could still hear the shots, like when we were at the door of the hotel, and it really just sounded, it sounded like fireworks going off. It just sounded like pop, 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 pop. The staff sat us down on the lobby couch and they're like, wait right here, we're going to go get you some first aid. Relax, madam. Okay.
we heard the same shots again. It was just like pow, 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 but this time shattering the glass of the hotel. And I mean, I just remember thinking like, you've got to be kidding me, like not again. As soon as I reached third floor where my suite was, one of the hotel chefs started shouting at me and says, sir, please run. There's a firing going on on the ground floor. Dara Huang runs into one of the hotel's restaurants. And as soon as I burst in, it's, there's diners there that are kind of like looking up with not a clue of what's going on. I just remember running straight to the kitchen. Then I hit a, a dead end. And I think that's when I started crying because you feel like once you hit a dead end, you just feel like you're dead and that that's the end. That's when I remember a Muslim woman next to me and she took the scarf off her head and she put it on the floor and she started praying. At that time, like the only thing we could do was pray. As Dara Huang prays for salvation, back at the CST rail station, the two gunmen are continuing their killing spree. Sudan Pandaka is an armed constable with Mumbai's railway police. He usually patrols women's train carriages. The two of them were back to back and rotating round and round. They were shooting at anybody they could see. Because some were shot in the stomach, to save their own lives they were holding their stomachs and desperately trying to get away from the concourse. While the two gunmen roam the station firing at random, police officers surround the building. The CST station police inspector came and asked five or six policemen to go with him. An advanced guard has one revolver and Saddam's ancient rifle. As soon as the officers engage the terrorists, they immediately come under attack. His bullet hit my chest and I collapsed. Then behind me, the inspector and constable were hit by rapid fire. They also collapsed. Because of the blood loss, they died on the spot. As the two gunmen from the station flee, over at the Taj Mahal Hotel, terrorists begin pulling guests from their rooms at gunpoint. At 11 p.m., one hour and 40 minutes after the first terror attack, two car bombs explode in different parts of the city. There are three sieges going on at the Trident Oberoi Hotel, at a Jewish study center, Nariman House, and at the Taj Mahal Hotel. In the Taj Mahal Hotel, Lord Ghulam Noon is barricaded into his third floor suite. With him are his brother and some business colleagues. Yeah, we could hear the, bullet, uh, the sound of the, uh, of the AK-47. And the bombs were exploding. The whole building shook. Well, I, I said to my brother, I said, don't worry. And I said, we'll all come out unscathed. We'll find a way out, don't worry. And we saw two boys were actually going up and down.
my suite was 361 and they were in 360. Just a wall, one wall between us. Concerned he will not escape alive, Lord Noon writes a death note to his family. At one point of time, I went to the bathroom and took two shower caps and wrapped it up and kept it in my hip pocket, hoping against hope that if I'm shot, at least the blood will not reach there, it will survive. Three floors below, Dara Huang is sheltering in a ground floor restaurant. We were all kind of hiding under the tables and we could kind of hear shots and we could hear, we could hear fire. More than six hours after the siege began, world news is dominated by the huge fire around the hotel's dome. A fire which is now spreading through the building. I could see from the people that the smoke was tremendous in the corridor. Then the smoke started coming in. It was frightening. receives a call from his terrified family in England who are watching events live on TV. And they could see on the television that the building is burning. I was giving them hope. I said, don't worry. One way or other, we'll, we'll come out alive. Don't worry. Dara Huang has been in the hotel restaurant for nearly six hours. Her fellow guests search the internet for news reports. We started to look at the news to see what was going on. I remember one of the things said that they're going around bombing each restaurant, so we thought, you know, well, we're sitting ducks. This man let me borrow his phone so that I could call my parents and actually say goodbye to them. Because I honestly thought that I was going to die that night. Dara hangs up for fear of worrying her family. You could see from her balcony where the bodies were coming out, police were going on. So it was a horrific scenario. So we waved out. And one fire officer actually uh, saw us. And we said, come up. During a break in the shooting, the fire brigade raised a platform to the third floor to rescue Lord Noon and his guests. As we came down, the firing started in our direction. And we could see the bullets around us. And we just ran. And that was our most lucky escape. With the terrorists still inside the hotel, National Security Guard commandos begin evacuating guests. We actually just had to run out. And all you saw were a bunch of policemen that were kind of hiding around the corner. And they had their fingers on the trigger. Although they also looked scared as well. As Dara Huang is ushered to safety, hundreds of people remain trapped inside the hotel. 
the world's media follow the attempts by security forces to free them. Everyone's taking cover now. At least two journalists have um, been injured. Uh, now that was gunfire coming from outside the hotel. At 11 a.m. on November the 28th, the siege at the Trident Oberoi Hotel is over. Rudrani Devi has been rescued, but 35 people lie dead, including two terrorists. Later that day, two gunmen at the Jewish center, Nariman House, are also killed by NSG commandos. It's the following day before the siege at the Taj Mahal Hotel is finally over. All four gunmen there are killed. The multiple attacks have lasted nearly 60 hours. 166 innocent people are dead, 18 from the Indian security services. Mumbai reels with shock. All India wants to know how terrorists could coordinate a series of terrifying attacks across the country's largest city without any apparent warning. Now by rewinding the events leading up to November the 26th, 2008 and going deep into the official investigation, we can reveal what lay behind the siege that gripped the world for three days and how crucial warnings were ignored. Police have the names of suspects for the massacre within hours of the first attack. At 1.30 a.m. on November the 27th, two gunmen are shot at a roadblock. One of them is killed. The other, 21-year-old Ajmal Kassab, kills a policeman, but is taken alive. <laughs> Three sieges are still going on as Kassab confesses to being a member of the Pakistani Islamic terrorist group Lashkar e Taiba. The group behind a series of train bombs in Mumbai in July 2006, which killed more than 200 Indian commuters. Kassab then names nine fellow terrorists engaged in his ruthless mission. He reveals they've been put through a punishing military training program in camps across Pakistan and trained specifically for this mission. So, सभी के लिए है सभी के लिए ये है रेल स्टेशन को जाना है रेल स्टेशन को जाना है बिल्कुल ठीक है ना L.E.T. trained the 10 terrorists to use all available cover in Mumbai. They're taught to speak Hindi with Indian accents to ensure they're not recognized as Pakistani. Kassab reveals that he and his fellow operatives arrived in India from Pakistan by sea via a hijacked Indian fishing trawler. With hundreds of kilometers of undefended shoreline around Mumbai and hundreds of fishing boats plying the waters, the terrorists know there's little chance of being intercepted by security services. At 8.30 p.m., they land in the dark at Badwa Park a fisherman's slum and quickly disappear into Mumbai. Either on foot or by taxi, all the terrorists reach their targets unimpeded. Then, with the benefit of total surprise, carry out their plan. Vapala Balachandran's career has taken him to the highest levels of India's police and intelligence services. 
He's charged with investigating the security service's response to the attacks. Balachandran wants to know whether there was any intelligence on the attack before the event. And he learns that Indian intelligence agencies had received warnings about Lashkar e Taiba. There were clear cut indications from these intelligence reports repeated, saying that Lashkar e Taiba is training a, a seaborne squad. The attack may come through the sea, they may in, literally invade, and it will be multiple targets. Vapala Balachandran wants to know how the authorities responded to intelligence received two years before the siege of Mumbai. Intelligence that LET were planning an attack from the sea. Despite having these repeated intelligence alerts from 2006 onwards, that these people are likely to come through the sea, nothing was done to protect the sea coast. Nearly three months before the attacks, intelligence names a number of primarily Western targets in Mumbai, including the Taj Mahal Hotel, the Trident Oberoi Hotel, and Cafe Leopold. The intelligence later says the attacks will not be in the form of bomb blasts, but will be carried out by gunmen who will stay and fight. These trickles are coming, but these people did not put all this in together and then make a picture out of it, you know. This is likely to come and this is how we have to respond to it. That was not done wrong. It is quite shocking. Balachandran discovers the authorities did not formulate a coordinated defense strategy. The intelligence does reach the local police, who temporarily increase their patrols and encourage the named targets to improve their own security, including closing multiple entrances, using metal detectors, and increasing the number of security guards. Security is stepped up at the hotels, but it's incompatible with the day-to-day -day operations of a luxury establishment. Just one week before the attacks, extra security is removed. There was a view at that time that the hospitality industry and the security clash. So they tried to minimize the security. At 9.20 p.m. on November the 26th, two terrorists approached the Trident Oberoi Hotel. They opened fire with machine guns, blasting the glass entrance doors and gaining access to the lobby. They are unchallenged as they walk through the hotel. They enter the Tiffin restaurant and spray the room with gunfire, wounding Rudrani Devi and killing her friends. The chief security man, he did remarkable work, but he couldn't cope with the situation. Around 20 minutes later, at the Taj Mahal Hotel, witnesses report the first two terrorists to get there are disguised as backpackers and presumed to be guests. It's at this moment that Lord Noon returns to his room and Arav Wang runs in after fleeing the carnage at Cafe Leopold, where 11 people died and 28 were wounded. The two men take their guns from their rucksacks and then start firing indiscriminately. Just over 15 minutes later, the two gunmen from the Cafe Leopold arrive and are nearly shot by their fellow terrorists. It's the first time a city has been hit with a multiple commando-style suicide attack. Five pairs of terrorists, just ten men, spread fear and chaos across India's largest city. Balachandran finds the city's police were impotent against the ten well-armed terrorists. The vast majority of police officers were armed only with a lati, a bamboo stick. Mumbai police, or for that matter, any any civil police in India, uh, trained to tackle only what is called civil disturbances. So the basic philosophy is, when they are asked to use force, they should use force to the minimum. Balachandran learns that many of the police who were armed with guns lacked weapons training because of shortages of ammunition. 
The guns the police had were no match for the terrorists' automatic AK-56s. The .303 bolt-action rifle Saddam Pandaka carried at the rail station was designed in 1895 and last used by British troops in the 1950s. In our inquiry we found in all these uh, cases the response of the police was there in a matter of five to six minutes. But they were ineffective because these, they couldn't face the firepower of the terrorists. They were ten steps ahead of the thinking of the uniform police or security agencies. To give the impression there were more terror teams operating across the city, the terrorists have planted bombs in the taxis they took to reach their targets. When these timed devices explode in different parts of the city, police control centers are bombarded with calls. Then the rumors started going. So about 60 terrorists have come, they invaded the city. The police control room had no idea that these taxis were all timed devices. They thought that they were also attacked. With police overrun and the authorities slow to realize that the scattered attacks are coordinated, it's 90 minutes after the first shots are fired before a call is made to the National Security Guard, a crack team of commandos trained in anti-terrorism operations. 200 commandos are authorized to assist. Unfortunately, there is only one NSG base, and it's nearly 1,400 kilometers away in Manasar. It took some time for them to get an aircraft. They could get it only by 4 o'clock in the morning, and they reached Mumbai at about 6 o'clock. By the time they were operational, at about 8 o'clock in the morning on 27th. Until this point, over 10 hours after the attacks began, the terrorists have met no effective resistance. The vast majority of the 166 civilian deaths have already occurred. Maybe the killings, some of the killings could have been uh, avoided if they had come much earlier. The Indian security forces face a ruthless enemy in the Pakistani terror group Lashkar-e-Taiba. One of the world's leading experts on LAT is Stephen Tankel. I have heard from U.S. military officials that when they encounter Lashkar fighters in Afghanistan, they are generally considered to be tactically uh, cut above the others that they come into contact with. LET's fighters are trained in camps actively supported by the Pakistani military and the security agency ISI. But traditionally, their activities are focused on Indian targets as part of their struggle to drive India out of the disputed border province of Kashmir. Tankel believes this is why the intelligence warning of LET's plans to attack Western targets across Mumbai was only half-heartedly acted upon. Mumbai came as a big shock to people, not just because of the scale and scope of the damage, but also because Lashkar Taiba was now targeting um, Western citizens, which is something that it wasn't seen to have done before. The Mumbai massacre was a way of LET bringing its campaign to the global stage. The Kashmir conflict had been moribund for some time. Uh, the Afghan insurgency, in which they were only a minor player, was going strong. And so I think one of the reasons for moving to a spectacular terrorist attack, a 10-person terrorist attack, was to bolster the group's uh, credibility. L.E.T. planned to exploit the inevitable news coverage that would follow this unprecedented assault on India and the West. The citywide attacks were designed to endure the 10 terrorists were specifically schooled in siege warfare. They talk about having had to endure training that entailed staying awake and active for multiple days. They were sent with, uh, you know, dried fruit and, and other things to try to help themselves maintain energy levels. Knowing that just 10 men will inevitably be outnumbered by Indian security services, the terrorists are also advised to occupy the upper levels of their target buildings. In all places they went up, 
so that the person who is coming from a lower level had the natural disadvantage. So they were lobbing uh, granite. But even with the terrorists' superior training, Mumbai's police are surprised the gunmen managed to keep the three sieges going for as long as they do at Nariman House, the Trident Oberoi Hotel, and the Taj Mahal Hotel. With Lashkar e Taiba's murderous track record, India's intelligence agencies have devoted considerable resources to uncovering and tracking their activities. Five days before the attack, an undercover police officer procures some Indian SIM cards. The officer then records the SIM numbers before giving the cards to an LET operative. Some of these SIM cards make their way into phones carried by the Mumbai terrorists. But, possibly aware of the potential of having calls intercepted, the terrorists don't use their phones until they reach their targets. With the SIM cards active, at 1.26 a.m., Indian intelligence officers listen in to their calls. It's too late to prevent the attacks, but what the officers hear surprises them. They discover the terrorists are receiving instructions and moral support from their handlers in Pakistan. We have heard recordings from some of the handlers who are on the phone with the people in the Taj Mahal Hotel urging them to start a fire because they knew that that would bring the media. <laughs> it captivated the world, um, you know, and Lashkri Taiba knew that it would do that. The handlers relay information from news reports to the four terrorists in the Taj Mahal Hotel. <laughs> It was a very interesting situation which Indian police have never experienced before. Balachandran learns the police could do nothing to shut down this line of communication. Mumbai police, their communication is the wireless. Everybody has a walkie-talkie, the vehicle will have wireless set and all. Because of the unusual number of uh, communication, that completely got jammed. So what the officers were doing is that each one was using his own cell phone. A personal cell was being used for all communication. If they had jammed or completely neutralized the whole thing, the police network would have been completely jammed. You know, they would not have been able to communicate at all. The handlers were controlling their operatives remotely from Pakistan. But it's clear the terrorists enjoyed another advantage, inside knowledge. Balachandran wants to know who provided that knowledge. Otherwise, India could be open to further attack. Pakistanis are not allowed to travel freely in India, and previous LET operations that used Indian operatives for reconnaissance prior to attacks ended with little success. The authorities are baffled. Then, ten months after the attack, they get a lucky break. In America. In Chicago, nearly 13,000 kilometers from Mumbai, U.S. citizen David Headley is arrested on suspicion of terrorist activity in Europe. So, what documents were you producing in Mumbai? But as he's questioned by the FBI, he confesses to helping plan the Mumbai attacks. David Headley is a fascinating individual. He's not a typical young jihadist. Tankel learns Headley is, in fact, half Pakistani. He was born Daoud Gilani in Washington, D.C. in 1960. 
He changed his name to disguise his ethnicity. He's born to a Pakistani father um, and an American mother. He grows up in Pakistan until he's in his late teens, at which point his mother brings him to America. Um, he never really quite fits in here. He returned to Pakistan in 2005 and joined L.E.T. His friends noticed he embraced Islam and became religious for the first time in his life. One would assume that Lashkar Taiba is very pleased to have somebody like David Headley. Having a Pakistani American operative who has an American passport and speaks multiple languages and can travel quite freely and pass himself off as a businessman. I mean, these things are all very valuable. David Headley confesses to making five trips to Mumbai in the two years before the attacks. He rents a flat and office space and begins his surveillance. He stays at the Taj Mahal Hotel and he joins sightseeing boat tours around Mumbai's harbor to find suitable landing sites. After each trip, he goes to Pakistan to hand his information to L.E.T. David Headley was a, a, a key piece um, of the Mumbai tax. Um, his surveillance uh, that he provided um, made an enormous difference in terms of the terrorists' ability to execute. Um, you know, after they landed. Headley strikes a deal with U.S. prosecutors. To avoid the death penalty, he pleads guilty to 12 counts of terrorism. <laughs> Having looked deep into the investigation, we can now reveal the series of events that allowed 10 terrorists free reign of India's largest city. Killing at will and terrifying the world for nearly three days. Three years to disaster. Having completed his training, Daoud Gilani is drafted to conspire with L.E.T. on the Mumbai attacks. Two years to disaster. He changes his name to David Headley, opens a branch of a friend's immigration business in Mumbai, and begins his surveillance. Around this time, Indian authorities get their first intelligence that L.E.T. are planning to target Mumbai by sea. Eleven months to disaster. Ajmal Kassab joins L.E.T. for weapons training. Three months to disaster. Indian authorities receive intelligence saying the Taj Mahal Hotel, the Trident Oberoi Hotel and Cathy Leopold would be attacked. But the authorities fail to devise an effective defense. Three days to disaster. Kassab and nine other terrorists have left Karachi, Pakistan. They hijack a fishing trawler, killing four fishermen. One hour to disaster. The ten terrorists land at a fisherman's wharf near their targets in central Mumbai. At 9.20 p.m., terrorists stage the first of their lethal attacks. Over the course of three days, they target Cathy Leopold and the city's main rail station and lay siege to Nariman House and two luxury hotels, the Trident Oberoi and the Taj Mahal. Fifty-nine hours after the attacks began, 166 civilians are dead and 235 wounded. The whole world has watched in disbelief at this unprecedented terrorist attack. They spread terror and panic, not just throughout Mumbai, um, but also, uh, you know, cities around the world. Specifically, coastal cities and littoral states, uh, you know, began considering, could this happen to us? Surviving terrorist Ajmal Kassab was tried and found guilty on 86 counts, including waging war on India, and was sentenced to death. Don't miss a nail-biting episode of Air Crash Investigation, brand new tomorrow at 9. Next, we look at the race to build the world's biggest bomb.